Hello, everyone. I'm flying a little bit blind here because I can't see me <laughs> in this application. But I want to um, start by introducing myself. I hope that I have gone live. Um, uh, my name is Rebecca Costa, and I am a sociobiologist and expert on fast adaptation in high failure rate environments. Um, I'm also a technology futurist. I don't know how I got the title futurist, but I suppose if you uh, are capable of putting enough data together and projecting what the next uh, occurrence is likely to be, you get that label pretty quickly. I hope that you are all safe and well, and uh, and that those that you love and care for are well as, uh, as well, and that you are uh, following the guidelines for COVID that have been issued by your individual governments and particularly your local governments. Um, it's as everybody knows, this is changing in real time, and uh, and so it's important to stay current with the news and whatever the new guidelines are. I've titled my presentation today, COVID-19, A Lesson in Fast Adaptation. I think it really should be called Ready for Anything. It occurs to me that we've been here before. Maybe not COVID-19, but the elements which uh, compose a, uh, a, a major sea change or um, uh, any kind of disruption like this tend to be the same. So we can learn the same things from COVID-19, the dot-com and subprime mortgage financial crises, a, a dangerous climate event or the unexpected collapse of a nation's currency or even a violent terrorist attack. They all contain pretty much the same elements. Now, I know that sounds like a crazy person talking because crazy people tend to put a lot of things together and, and observe a pattern, which is, of course, ridiculous. But in this particular case, it holds true because just about the time complexity is skyrocketing, the amount of relevant data that we have and the time we have to make a decision is going down. So we have this inverse relationship that occurs and it happens all at once. And we don't know what exactly is happening or how to make a decision in such an environment. So on the complexity side, you've got the velocity of change, the urgency of making a decision. There are new demands and a new variety of demands. There's new data sources. The number and the mix of stakeholders changes and gets bigger. The costs rise. The opportunity for risk and failure uh, increases. Um, so do uh, a over-reliance on unproven beliefs and opinions. Um, our emotions, our reactivity is up. But on the positive side, innovation and, and creativity goes up. Teamwork and collaboration with partners we didn't uh, collaborate before. Um, uh, uh, start, suddenly starts to occur. Uh, and the speed of implementation, of course, really, really starts to go a lot faster. On the data and time decrease, we lose our ability to have any deliberation or planning. We can't really test the veracity of any data or its reliability. There's no more testing or proof of concept. Approvals go away. Optimization goes away. Uh, income and resources go down. The historical relevance of data that we've accumulated over a long period of time uh, kind of becomes irrelevant. We need real-time data. Safety goes down and, of course, leadership, the, the uh, strength of leadership really goes down. But on the positive side, we lose bureaucracy. You'll notice in the United States, all these uh, steps that you have to go through to get approval by the uh, Food and Drug Administration just went by the wayside and all of a sudden we could shortcut approvals. Competition goes down because there's much more collaboration. And of course, the amount of uh, time it takes to make a decision has to be compressed. According to Carly Fiorina, who's the former CEO of Hewlett Packard, we're navigating a thicket of complexity. So what happens? You know, what are the levels that we go through when we face a disruption like COVID-19? Well, level one is there's disbelief, denial, delay, and a complete misunderstanding of what exponentiation is. Then level two is there's a rush to act with very little verifiable data and there's forced collaboration. Level three is there's a double down on actions which show any kind of early effectiveness. Level four, which is where we are now with COVID-19, is that we start to refine our analytics and our priorities based on whatever real new data is coming in. 
Level five is we begin to optimize and maximize our response. Level six is we institutionalize the successes for future readiness. And level seven is we develop a forward-facing, predaptive culture that is not reactive, but is predaptive, which is which is basically getting out ahead of the problem before it occurs. Level one, let's talk about level one for a minute. It's disbelief, denial, delay, and misunderstanding of exponentiation. I give this uh, question to a number of executives and I have to smile because uh, they're such evolved linear thinkers, the mass majority of them get it wrong. So, and, and the reason we get it wrong is because our, our brains have evolved to solve problems in a linear fashion. So let's take this example. There's a beautiful pond, it's like paradise. And on day one, there's one lily pad in the pond. And every day, the number of lily pads is going to double. So on day one, it's one, on day two, it's two, day three, there'll be four, day four, there'll be eight, and it goes like that. Now, it so happens on this particular pond, on day 36, the pond is going to be completely covered with lily pads. And it's going to go into an ecological meltdown because it's going to starve out some of the other life forms that depend on, on the uh, pond. So here's my question. On what day is the pond only half full of lily pads? Well, if you're an evolved linear thinker, the pond is, is completely covered on day 36. So when I ask you on what day is the pond half full, you take half of 36, which is 18, and you say the pond is half full on day 18, and we have 18 days to solve the problem and prevent it from going into an e ecological meltdown. But here's the deal. If the number of lily pads is doubling every day, the correct answer is the pond is half full on day 35 just one day before day 36, 24 hours before we have a crisis on our hands, not 18 days. So whether it's a fast moving pandemic like COVID-19 or a financial crisis or, or a terrorist attack, we have far less time than we think. We think we have 18 days when in fact we may only have 24 hours. And this leads to level two, which is a rush to act with very little verifiable data and forced collaboration. When exponentiation meets with complexity, the ground beneath our feet begins to shift. We don't know what's up. And in a complex environment, there are many more wrong choices than there are a number of right ones. And the number of wrong options, wrong ways to go is exponentially growing by the minute. So our odds of picking the right solution, the right course of action are very poor and are getting increasingly poor. Instead of looking for a needle in a haystack, we're suddenly overnight looking for one particular needle in stacks of needles. There are many symptoms which occur when complexity begins exponentiating. One is the dilemma of overchoice. Too many options is the same as having none. You can't pick. Paralysis by analysis. When do we stop analyzing and trying to optimize and we act? There's a confusion between what is an empirical fact and what's an unproven belief and an opinion. People become failure avoidant. It, we, we start to become very fear-based, and this causes great delays that are very critical. Hippo, you might have heard H-I-P-P-O, the highest paid person's opinion in the room suddenly wins for no other reason. And then lastly, institutional resistance. We have a Pavlovian tendency to continue doing what was previously successful, even though it's not exactly working well and sometimes won't work in the future and we already know that. So with so many options and so little data and time, how do we decide in the middle of a crisis? Well, we don't, that's the answer, we don't. Now I've written about 12 principles of fast adaptation that determine success in nature and also work for societies, organizations and individuals. Today, I'm not gonna have time to go through these, but I am gonna focus on one that has been very, very important in the COVID crisis. Any drive towards singularity is a drive toward extinction. 
many people say, I don't know what a high failure rate, you know, environment is. Well, you probably do. And you, you just haven't called it that. that. Those are a lot of words and, and not a lot of people refer to it. My dad used to laugh and say, when you introduce yourself, you might not want to tell people what your specialty is, because I've noticed people move away from you at cocktail parties. And that was probably some really good advice. The fact is, if you have a financial portfolio, you're already operating and using one of the key principles that's an essential adaptive strategy in a high failure rate environment. You haven't put all your money in one stock. You've bought stocks and bonds and ETFs and all kinds of instruments so that when one thing goes up, another goes down, you, you at least will stay even if not uh, on the positive side. When there isn't sufficient data to optimize decision making, we have to open up the funnel. We have to stop trying to choose the right course and the right pathway on the front end. In other words, we have to become a venture capitalist. Venture capitalists don't try to pick one company to invest in. They look at a category and they might invest in 20 or 30 companies, but they have very clear points of triage. They basically say, all right, we're going to get into 3D printing or robotics or AI or quantum computing or blockchain technology. Doesn't matter. They'll go in and they'll find four or five or 20 or 30 of the best companies in that category and then monitor their progress. Very few get through to round two fun funding and even fewer get to round three funding. So when we're looking for solutions, we have to look at a very wide variety of solutions and then monitor their progress as we go. Now, how does this apply? Well, there are two types of innovation and responses. Some are market driven. Those can be developed immediately and instituted immediately because they don't require any education. If people say shelter in place, don't leave your house, we already know what a house is. We know what don't leave is. It doesn't have to be explained. Then there are moonshots. These are slow development. They generally require some regulatory uh, uh, approvals. They have undetermined schedules and outcomes. They require higher investment. They have a higher failure uh, rate. Uh, but they also command higher margins for organizations. They tend to cannibalize an older product or a service. They represent a preemptive strike against a danger. Let's look at how the U.S. government's diversified response to COVID-19 worked. What were their market-driven responses? Well, they said social distancing, shelter in place, task force, check your temperature, wash your hands, masks and gloves, disinfecting surfaces. The they evoked the Defense Production Act. They called for volunteerism, hydroxychloroquine, uh, convalescent plasma therapy, remdesivir, drive-through testing. They closed public institutions. They closed air travel. They instituted a CARES protection program, supplemental unemployment a food assistance program, SBA small business loan, state and local government assistance, local suspension of evictions. They moved the IRS tax, federal tax uh, deadline. They had daily press conferences. Uh, you know, they, they did a lot of things, not knowing what would work. They weren't really sure all of it would work. And let's look at the moonshots, the longer plays, the more important plays, vaccine development, fast and easy economical testing that people might be able to do at home, new treatments and pharmaceuticals. These are things that are high investment, high risk, and take a longer period of time. So now we've been through this for several months. You know, four or five months later, what have we discovered? We've discovered, well, disinfecting services doesn't really have as big a payoff as we thought. Hydroxychloroquine doesn't work. The call for volunteerism, it worked for a couple of weeks and people got impatient and started leaving their houses without masks. And so now you see local, state and federal governments stepping in and making things mandatory again because the volunteerism didn't work. And we'll know over time as all of these market driven responses uh, uh, give us more real-time data, we'll know more about what worked and what really didn't pay off at all. Let me say one thing about opening that funnel and trying many things at one time and then monitoring them to see what works. 
even uh, uh, the best venture capitalists only expect maybe 10, 15, 20% on an excellent year of their investments to pay off. But the wins are so significant, they more than compensate for the losses. So you can't back away from failure. That said, not every type of failure is the right kind of failure. There, according to Dr. Yammer Hunt, there are six types of failure, only two of which help you do, uh, to advance and to progress. Abject failure is the worst kind. That's, that's kind of like mortgage-backed securities, Theranos, where the mistake that you've made has done you in, don't bother to, you, you never come back from it. There's structural failure. It cuts deeply, but there's no permanent damage. Windows Vista is a good example of that. Uh, there's glorious failure. Uh, the best example of that is the Jamaican bobset sled team. They didn't expect to win the bobsledding competition uh, in the Olympics, but they sure had a great time failing. And then there's common failure, everyday failures. You're late to a meeting. You forget to pick up dry cleaning. They, they, it's really innocuous. But there are two types of failure that are very important toward moving toward progress. And that is version failure, small failures, which lead to incremental improvements over time and predicted failure. And that's things like prototyping. So using those two failures as a guideline, fail early and fail often is really the motto for what you need to do when you're under fire historical data is not very useful and you don't have enough real-time data and the real-time data that you have cannot be verifiable. Now, due to limited time, I can't look at all the, le the levels today, but I want to take a few moments, just a few moments to talk about the ultimate solution to COVID-19 and other future disruptors, which is level seven. So if you've been paying attention, I'm jumping from levels one and two straight to level seven because it represents our future. And that is to develop a forward-facing, predaptive culture. What I've been talking to you about to this point is strategy. It's what you can do. It's actions that you can take. But Peter Drucker said it best, culture eats strategy for lunch. You need a cultural revolution in terms of your strategic thinking in order to get on top of these problems so that you're not buried by them. And when it comes to fast adaptation in a crisis situation and any kind of hope of innovation, institutional resistance is the biggest obstacle. And there's there are reasons that good ideas get turned down and innovative ideas get turned down and future thinking precautions get turned down inside of corporations. We are Pavlovian by nature. We are designed in our DNA to repeat the things that previously made us successful, even when they stop working and won't work in the future. But one of the technologies, and there are many of them that is changing that is artificial intelligence, predictive analytics, and many, many other technologies are allowing us to see what the outcomes of our actions are going to be so that we can get out ahead of disruptive change and not get buried by it. In other words, instead of trying to adapt on the fly really quickly with very little information to guide us, we can predapt. What is adaptation? It's adjusting to a new condition during or after the change has occurred, but preadaptation is preemptive. It's to quash, alter, or lessen an undesirable outcome and to leverage future opportunities by adapting before the change has occurred. So if we know what's coming, why not just get out ahead of it? The truth is we know more about the future than any other time in human history. Used to be a couple of years ago, you didn't know if a pregnant woman was having a boy or a girl. Today, with 100% certainty, we can tell you the gender of the child. And there are a number of cars that will look out ahead and anticipate that you might hit another car or an object and stop the car on your behalf. In fact, the MKZ Lincoln even has an algorithm that knows that you tap the brakes differently when you're falling asleep than you do in a parking lot. And because it knows that you're falling asleep, it will uh, alert you and ask you to pull over and get some rest. Genetic testing is predaptive. There's so many 
uh, dangerous physiological conditions that we can test infants for. And in many cases, through genetic engineering, we can head off those diseases from ever occurring. And if you are a science nerd like myself, you know that the GOES Next Generation weather satellites were launched just a year ago that are giving us four times resolution, they're five, time, five times faster. And so our weather predictions for uh, dangerous uh, rains and flooding and uh, tsunamis are all getting much, much better. In fact, I, I like to make this bet with people that I can predict that an elderly person is going to trip and fall within the next three weeks with about an 86% accuracy. And the reason for that is because we've now discovered that there's a three to five centimeter per second change in a person's normal walking gait. We didn't know that before, and it's indiscernible by the human eye. But this happens before you fall. And so if that changes, you know, just imagine a Fitbit type of device on your on your grandmother or your mother's ankle that says, hey, your walking gait has changed. You need to get into physical therapy of some type. We could send an alert to their phone saying stay off of uneven surfaces. We could alert caretakers because in many cases for the elderly, once they take that fall, that means they're permanently in assisted living. And, you know, no one wants to leave their home. Nobody at any age wants to give up their home and go into assisted living. It's estimated that this technology alone, by preventing people from falling, will allow people to stay in their homes as much as three to five years longer. And we also know other kinds of uh, data uh, that, that, we could, that would allow us to take preventative action and head off catastrophes. For example, we know what the danger words are. They're linked to physical pain, depression, suicide, mass violence, heart disease, diabetes. They are these words. When these words begin to show up, there's a problem. But we also know well-being words. We know the words that are linked to happiness and thriving and productivity and health. And, and it, it's not a secret. We know what those words are. So every minute of every day, we are growing much more precise at predicting future events, outcomes, and what those demands might be. And that foresight means preemption. It means not having to go through what we're going through right now. So in conclusion, the highest instrument of our evolutionary inheritance is our ability to preview future outcomes and then do something in the present to avert a danger or to get on top of an opportunity. It's taken millions of years for the frontal cortex to develop. It represents a third of our brain. But the wonderful thing, the wonderful capability that the, that the uh, frontal cortex has is its ability to imagine and to take data and to look at the future and then say, we don't need to go there. I'm going to do something prophylactically to prevent a crisis or a disaster. These predaptive technologies are offering us the unprecedented opportunity in all of human history to act before the fact. So let's move as quickly as possible together to level seven and beyond. I'm going to stop here, and I believe that they are going to um, feed me questions. <laughs> this is a new format for me, so I hope you'll all be patient. So in the few moments while we're waiting for questions, I'm not sure if I've created a technical problem that doesn't allow the questions to come through. And if I have, I'm very, very sorry. If you do have questions, you can go to my website, 
which is www.rebeccacosta.com. That's R-E-B-E-C-C-A-C-O-S-T-A.com. And I think if you, you know, even if you don't have a question, if you want to get the most current and accurate information about COVID-19, I am in touch with over 190 scientists around the world. You can go to our website and we will periodically post updates Particularly, I, I'm particularly sensitive to updates when the um, when the media might be misrepresenting things, um, or in the press conferences there might be something uh, confusing. There, uh, I will take a time. I will take the time to uh, go back and explain what that really means. Um, but there's a great uh, if you're interested in how problems tend to exponentiate. And uh, what that means and how to not allow them to exponentiate. Um, there's a great article on the uh, landing page for, again, it's www.rebeccacosta.com. Well, I understand that I can't really see questions uh, in this format. So I'm going to go sign off the way that I introduced myself. I'm Rebecca Costa and I'm a sociobiologist and also a technology futurist. But mostly, I am a concerned citizen, and I am hoping that each and every one of you who has listened to this broadcast are well and taking care of those you love and even those that you don't know. So thank you so much for joining me today.